You're listening to UCW Radio. In your face. What we got here is a failure to communicate. Oh, have I got your attention now? We relax the better word. It's good. You know what I mean? Money to be made in a place like this. Money never sleeps, pal. You're crazy. Don't run when you lose. Don't whine when it hurts. You know what it takes to sell real estate? It takes brass, 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 brass. I'm falling, and I can't get up. All right, welcome to Money Never Sleeps. This is the show where we tackle the topics that impact the flow of money, from public to private companies, to global industries, politics, and events. We touch on everything. Now, the month of September has been an interesting one so far. Uh, we've seen a social media giant go from Wall Street disappointment to return to a uh, darling status, while another takes advantage of the Jobs Act and files their S-1 and wraps to becoming a publicly traded company. And, of course, I'm talking about none other than Facebook and Twitter. Um, so interesting situations happening there. And sticking on the tech front for a bit, it's been a wild scene with Apple. You know, they, they got downgraded. Then they stepped up and they really shut up all the naysayers with record sales of 9 million units. Uh, let me repeat that. Nine million units of their latest iPhone, the iPhone 5S. Now, it's not them selling nine million units, which impressed me. It was that this was done just over the weekend. And with another 200 million users uh, downloading uh, the latest iOS 7. So, uh, yeah, uh, they, they, didn't make, they didn't make a deal to distribute lower-priced phones via China Mobile. Uh, and China Mobile, they have over 500 million users. But in the words of Tim Cook, uh, Apple doesn't deal in junk. Whatever that means, I'm not, I'm not going to touch on it. Uh, but who knows if they'll bend the rules, the Apple rules, a bit down the road to take advantage of that huge market. Now, that was one of the big uh, shocks that hit the street. The other is the demise of what was once the golden child of the mobile industry, uh, the once mighty BlackBerry. Yeah, you know, after changing its trading symbol, uh, changing its name, trying to change its image, coming out with a new device, even wooing developers to bring more apps to its platform. Uh, yeah, they, they, they are a classic tale of a little bit too much, a lot too late. Uh, they kind of missed the boat on a lot of things. The company got lax during the growth of the mobile industry. Uh, they rested on their perch while companies like Apple and Google innovated, bringing mobile users around the world what they crave. And now, uh, honestly, the only thing that we're waiting for is uh, the bell and the fat lady singing because this is a story that every enterprise in the world of tech or in any, any, any industry should learn from. Just because you're on top of the mountain, you're on top of your game now, doesn't mean that you will always be if you choose not to continue to innovate and participate in the growth of your industry. Uh, we've seen it in the auto industry as well. You know, lots of companies fall into that trap, and at the end of the day, it's the investors that follow, that follow blindly that pay the ultimate price with losses. But with BlackBerry, the one silver lining that, that I saw uh, was the potential of bid that's on the table to take the company private at nine bucks a share. You know, honestly, and I say this with all due respect, any investor still in this stock after that news today is setting themselves up for disaster, in my opinion. Yes, the company has cash in the bank, but, you know, dropping their revenue by 50% and cutting almost 45% of their workforce, you know, look, big growth prospects look really, really dark. So in my opinion, take the money and run. Something wrong with, with, with going and putting your money to work somewhere else that will actually make you money. And lastly, uh, we I just mentioned auto and the auto industry. Chrysler has filed their S1 to go public as well. Uh, again, you know, look, this, <laughs> this company has gone public more times than any company actually should be allowed to. Uh, so you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens as uh, you know. Giants such as GM and Ford, and some other of the leaders in the industry, 
continue to expand and innovate. And talking about innovation, talking about technology, you know, look at Tesla. Ooh-wee. This, I mean, what what uh, Elon Musk is doing with this company and how he's approaching it, it's really interesting. And I think that they're setting the stage, you know, for this to be a, um, I'm not going to call revolution, we'll call it an evolution of sorts. Um, once they map out how to develop a lower-cost vehicle, and once they have all these stations that can charge your your electric cars, uh, watch out as there there may be a massive switch on our hands because I, I don't know if BMW and a few other car companies have actually tried to come out with an electric car, but they haven't been successful. Uh, Elon Musk, you know, has this you know has this all down pat. You know, and they, they call him our, you know, the, the real life Tony Stark uh, in tech. So, you know, that just may be it right there. Uh, now, on that note, it's time for me to bring on a man that is in the deepest end of the private equity industry. He's the guy that helps get these private equity funds funded. And it's an exciting time in private equity, especially with what, uh, what the, the SEC uh, just uh, began to allow, uh, and I, it, it's it's going to be really interesting um, because now they're going to allow for advertising of uh, hedge funds and private equity to occur. So please join me in welcoming the CEO of Ario Capital, John Best, to Money Never Sleeps. <laughs> John, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Good, Lou. Thanks for having me again. Oh, I always, always want to have you on this show. We have a lot of a lot of things to talk about. It, this, the, the show always gets very interesting when we have you on. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so tell us, what's going on in, uh, in the world of private equity? Well, what's interesting is, and I just released this in my blog, is that nearly two-thirds – of uh, portfolio managers said that uh, that the private equity funds uh, in their allocation is performing better than any of the other investments in their portfolio, and I I think that uh, speaks loudly towards um, being able some of these private equity firms being able to put together that deal flow in a uh, organized fund structure and uh, be able to produce. Uh, IRRs or internal rates of return well exceeding uh the equity markets and bond markets. So I, I think there's uh, I think they're on to something. And why do you think that's happening? Well I think that as uh, these private equity firms are are evaluating, doing their due diligence on these companies and putting together these lower to middle market companies that uh do have little more risk, but a lot more return, um, that alpha is soaring um, on, on behalf of the private equity firms that are, are putting these investments within the fund structure. So, so they're going back to their roots as opposed to being value investors. They're actually going for growth. Yes, and I think that they're – they're achieving that by by doing that due diligence and putting together a collaboration with their analysts of these uh, companies that they think will produce superior returns. And inevitably, it's not only them that thinks their returns are superior, but other managers as well. Well, I think we're you know the times are changing. You know, I think that a lot of the uh, the damage in the markets have provided a lot of opportunities, um, and I, I believe that you have a lot of, uh, you know, mid-sized companies that are starving for uh, private equity investment because they need to grow. And right. what what's going on there? You can't you can't get you can't get a uh, a line of credit to save your life. Not that you don't want it; you want to get it. You know, but it, they, they, it's becoming increasingly difficult, in my opinion, for these right. companies to to grow. Right, right. Let's face it, credit has been tight, uh, not just uh, 
in, within one sector, but in many sectors, uh, and therefore really uh, stifling growth within the United States. Yeah, that, that's that's sad because you know you stifle growth. What happens? It, it impacts jobs. People don't right. have they, they're not getting jobs. You're not getting that job growth. And you you hear a lot of people complaining or you, the numbers come down, come come in the wrong way for uh, unemployment, and and they wonder why. Why can't we create jobs? Well, you can't create jobs because you're not letting companies create these jobs. You're not giving them right. the tools to create these jobs, you know, and it's sad because even with a company like Apple, uh, they can give them a lot of incentives to uh, repatriate those funds in order for them to create uh, jobs in the U.S. as opposed to, you know, uh, sending those jobs elsewhere. All right, and uh, Duff and Phelps interviewed uh, financial advisory firms and investment banking firms and uh, of these, uh, they quizzed over 100 uh, limited partner investors in both Europe and the United States, and two-thirds of them plan to increase their allocation over the next 12 months. Um, matter of fact, uh, they said 95% of those interviewed plan to increase their allocation to private equity. Wow. Wow, that, that's, that's really interesting. Now, it... Do you, do you think that a lot of, especially now with what's happening here uh, stateside, do you think that a lot of overseas private equity funds are actually looking to, um, I guess, to pick apart opportunities here in the U.S.? Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing um, a lot of firms in uh, London and uh, elsewhere in Europe, but, but primarily a lot in London really investing both here, United States, and Asia, so they seem to be picking apart um, both uh, continents uh, to look for uh, those specific uh, investments that, that they feel uh, will add value to their portfolio. Yeah, because yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, I think that there, there is definitely a lot of opportunity stateside and in all industries, um, whether it be real estate, whether it be tech, and you have so many different opportunities uh, here. And, and again, I, I believe, you know, even with that Smithfield deal, uh, with, uh, you know, they, I, I believe that they're allowing it to happen with the Chinese-based company taking over the, uh, the, uh, the company, the uh, Smithfield, uh, with, the, with the pork and the beef and everything right. else. Uh, I think that's a big mistake. I really right. do think that's a mistake. You know, you're taking an asset, you know, a commodity that we have, and you're giving it away. I, you know, just well, like taking a, a coal company here in the U.S. and let, letting it be sold to Russia. You know, it, to me, it doesn't make any sense. Right. And, and uh, of course, the trend is coming back around similar to the days of uh, – of the Japanese investing in Hawaiian real estate. Now the Chinese, it's very prestigious for them to invest in uh, U.S. commercial real estate. Um, you know, to say that uh, you've got um, U.S. Um, real estate assets is um, is a very prestigious thing now in Asia. Yeah, yeah, and, and also, you know, Russia has been doing it for a bit too. You've had the, the Russian billionaires, the, the private equity funds over there just coming in and gobbling assets uh here in the US just, you know, at will. And and not small assets, it's just, you know, uh, over the top assets. <laughs> right. Right. You know so it's so it's I, um it's a trend that is uh is developing and and um, and I think, as I mentioned in prior shows, that we're, we're going to continue to see uh, that trend develop and, and increase and uh, and and rightfully so because um, uh, you know many of these um, so-called uh, better corporate earnings are, are really um, uh, edging over over previous years, there, there's not a significant increase in corporate earnings, and and um, 
And frankly, uh, we're not seeing the GDP uh, expand. We are seeing unemployment shrink slightly, but but comparative to you know, I mean, the real the real test is the GDP numbers, and the GDP numbers are not significantly higher than where they were. Yeah, and I mean, look, right now there's a lot of stuff going on uh, in politics, and you you know. And you've had some strong opinions on the fiscal cliff, Obamacare, and you know, all that ties into what you just mentioned. Because you know, if if you're not allowing, you know, the uh, the country to grow, um, of course, the, your GDP is going to continue to to be decimated. Right, and and I continue to see a trend whereby. Um, um, uh, larger PE firms, uh, executives are breaking away from uh, the Apollos of the world, the George Soros of the world, the mm-hmm. Serbius of the world. Hell, I know one firm that Bob Giardelli uh, broke away from Serbius with another guy, and they started a small PE firm, and right now they're working on getting their track record. And um, you're, you're, they've got plenty of deal flow, and you're seeing a lot of these smaller PE firms pop up which to me signifies that, you know, it's no longer the KKRs of the world, the Blackstones of the world running in the Bain Capitals, running the, the PE markets. And my, my theory is, and I've told this to, to numerous uh, people who are uh, contemplating my services, that I, I think we're going to see the trend of the, the 62, the 66-year-old, the 68-year-old, uh, who's running his company efficiently and productively, as you mentioned earlier, not uh, staying on top of his game because he's constantly reinventing himself. But all of a sudden, here comes higher corporate taxes, higher personal taxes, and now higher health care taxes. And these smaller new PE firms are going to court these these guys, 66, 68 years old, and say to them, I'll offer you 60 cents on the dollar, 75 cents on the dollar. Take that golden parachute, parachute out of this corporate world, stay on as an advisor, as a consultant. We'll pay you a salary, and uh, let us go ahead and put your company inside of our fund, and, and we've got all these other deal flow. We're, we're going to create this this massive fund, and um, and you're seeing more funds, PE funds, pop up seeking more funding uh, and I think it's, that trend is going to dramatically increase next year as Obamacare, uh, well, well, we'll see whether or not uh, Senator Cruz and, and uh, Senator Reid uh, take, the, take off the gloves and, and really duke it out on the, on the Senate floor. But yeah, that, 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 next, that's going to be something. That's definitely going to be if, something. If next year, I mean, if Harry Reid gets his way, uh, I think that you're going to see a lot of corporations say, to hell with this, and uh, take that golden parachute and parachute out of here. And subsequently, I think deal flow is going to increase even more, and I think the, the equity markets will tumble. I have to differ with you, Lou. I think the gold markets, I think we could see $2,400 an ounce by 2016 very easily. Well, yeah, I guess it, it, it depends. You know, I... I just think, you know, that the gold markets, in my opinion, you know, uh, gold is up dramatically. You know, you you don't, you don't have people hoarding it like, you know, like they say. Um, ETFs are actually, you know, kind of like at the forefront of uh, the price uh, going up. You know, um, that's not to say that it can't go up there. I just, you know, for me, um, the, the value... It isn't there. That, that means I'm as seeing much as a trend where where India is bar- buying large quantities of gold. Putin is buying large quantities of gold. Soros well, is buying, buying large India quantities. Is buying, yeah, but India is buying large quantities of gold because it's it's wedding season. So you they, they right. give that as gifts. And, and look, right. and, but, and, and but, with but that said, not, you know, I, in, I, I, in, in I India goes, they don't sell. They don't sell I think gold. It goes beyond that. I think that yeah. you're seeing also the central banks in the United States buy large quantities of gold. There's a lot of hidden 
uh, large acquisitions of this commodity that are going on behind the scenes that people aren't seeing, that I am mm-hmm. seeing, and that uh, that as the, the prices have come down from some profit-taking, these guys are buying, and I talked to, uh, to one uh, private equity firm that said that they're buying large quantities right now. They're taking advantage of the lower prices, and they mm-hmm. think that uh, – that we could even see gold at 5000 an ounce. Well, look, honestly, you know, is with gold in, in 12 months, 24 months, is it going to go to 2500 that type of thing? I can't tell you that. But what I, what I can say is that, you know, in my opinion, I feel that gold should come in a little bit, okay? Um, and I think that it may. It just still may, depending on what happens. I mean, Geopolitical issues is going to dictate that's going to dictate that, so it's going to be really interesting. You know, I'm not well, saying inflation, that inflation be term, also, I'm not saying if, that longer term that it won't go up, but if if Obamacare continue, does pass, and, and by the way, the Affordable Health Care Act, they said today on the Senate <laughs> floor, what happened to the word affordable? <laughs> so, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, so, it, 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 it's funny. It's just we really. It's, I mean, I, I, I want to. Uh, I want to like. I mean, I for President Obama, I like him. For what what he is and what he has accomplished. I don't like a lot of the things that have transpired. You know, um, he he he's a he's can shift things around. It's interesting. He can, right. he can but divert. I, I think if he can divert your attention like a champ. <laughs> yeah, the very cost, the very cost that are going to take place, I think are going to be inflationary, and I think those additional costs will accelerate that that fear of inflation, and subsequently will be a catalyst towards that acceleration of the price of gold. It could very well happen. You know, it could very well happen. I think that the Affordable Care Act and you know what you know the you know AKA the Obamacare and what's happening there. I think it's going to be you know I think it's going to be problematic. Um, you know he's making it as if you know they want to they want to mess with him, but in reality, you know this being passed is messing with this economy. This, if right. this gets passed and this goes through, is messing with not only you know it's the economy, but all you know corporate America, and basically you know you're going to take people that are on the edge already and pushing them over. You know you have people I can rec- struggling to, to, to right. survive. You know, Lou, I can recall just a few years ago when the equity markets weren't doing well, and and some of the people who were retirees complaining about how they had to take a second job as a greeter at Walmart's because their 401 caves were down in value and wait till Obamacare hits them in the pocketbook and they're whacked for extra taxes and then the, the equity markets are down, boy, they're really going to be complaining. Well, well, look, I just read something in the news. This guy, uh, he was like 70-something years old, okay, worked. He was a, he was a high officer, you know, and then – in corporate America. Yeah, blue first and, class. You know, yeah, exactly. Did all that. Now he's yeah. flipping burgers. Yeah, it's 10 okay. bucks an hour because he didn't save. And, and that goes back to your point earlier about uh, BlackBerry being on top. And, and that's mm-hmm. one thing that I can recall, too. When you're an executive and you're on top, boy, you got to put away for that yep. uh, those monies so that down the road – when you're not making those kind of seven-figure incomes, that you've got something to show for it. Yeah. No, I, I think what what happens, and again, just just like I mentioned with BlackBerry, you know, companies and people, you know, they rest in their laurels. They think that right. uh, the where every train is going to be there, they can sit there right. and just watch TV all day, and everything's going to be okay. That's not the world we live in. You know, you need as individuals, as corporations in this country, you have to be innovative. You have to continue to innovate. And, you know, as individuals, you go and you have to, you know, set yourself up so that you can retire and enjoy your life. Because, look, we, we're here so that we can enjoy life. 
not killing yourself until you know in, in your seventies working because that's what you know that's what transpires. You know, there's something right. wrong with that picture, and I don't think that people are being are getting the the education uh, enough education in, in regards to how to do that. But right. again, you know, you have you have some individuals that had their money in these four hundred one k's and things like that that collapsed. So that contributed to uh, the further of the problem as well. Well, and, and right here in Detroit, Lou, uh, mm. Ford Motor Company, General Motors, uh, and Chrysler all guilty of uh, bringing in, bringing fidelity into their uh, workers for the 401k, and then not having fidelity discuss. Uh, the the risks involved with the various funds within those 401k uh, plans and subsequently uh, having some of the workers sue General Motors and Ford and and be awarded um, large um, victories in in the courtrooms uh, because they said that uh, uh, Ford Motor Company and General Motors was uh, did, did not sufficiently and prudently explain the risk involved in the funds, and they just gave them a list of funds to choose from, and the average guy uh, who works on the line had no idea what he was choosing. And, of course, back in the year 2000 when the tech market was booming, I remember thinking the same thing. This is going to go on forever. This is great. We're in a new we're in a new economy, they kept saying. We're in a new economy. Mm-hmm. But we know, we know what happened there. Yeah, we know what happened there. And you know what? There's this, this backlash still going on from that. You know, from that, which led into the mortgage crisis, which led into everything that we were right. dealing with. You got J.P. Morgan getting slapped with billions of dollars of fines. And they're still, and then they're still not out of the water. They have... They have, uh, you know, people from the government working in their offices all over the all over the place, you know, looking and investigating and seeing everything. And a lot of dirt is uh, is not being swept under the rug. It's actually it's actually coming to light. I remember so, Lou when they were doing those uh, mortgage derivatives, and mm-hmm. uh, they were doing the Black Scholes model and and back testing their their theories and on these derivatives and. And they thought they had it all figured out, and and the risk involved, and really no analyst really had a had a had a certainty of the of the risk involved in those derivatives. They were calculated models, financial models, but but no one really knew the the scope of the inventory that was being sold globally to various institutions. And I can recall um, going to in 2008. To a uh, a conference, and Ron Insana was the uh, speaker, and he was talking about the scope of the trillions and trillions of dollars that was floating out in the marketplace, and how how um, everyone miscalculated those risks. And I can recall uh, making a phone call to the CEO of the hedge fund that I was working for, saying. We got to make some changes. Yeah, it, you know, it was it was alarming. But you know, nobody wants to to see the reality. Nobody, you know, when everything's great, hey, it's going to be great forever. Market's going up; it's going to stay this way forever. That doesn't happen. Just you know, we don't live in a marshmallow world. You know, things go up, things go down. You know, times change. The the sad part about it is that history, history always repeats itself. Yeah. And we, we, we see this happening now. You know, you get this Obamacare. This is reminding me of, of Jimmy Carter. You know, we can, we, we can kind of like, we can go into a, uh, a, a really, a, not, not a recession, a recession. This can go into a state of depression. Uh, well, it you reminds have me of Hillary's term when Hillary and Bill tried to get it passed. And, of course, mm-hmm. back then, uh, um Gingrich, he did shut down the government for a week. And and like I said in prior shows, I don't recall the news media uh, attacking uh, the Republican Party 
you know, and, and saying that, you know, they're going to be the cause of it. They're going to be the blame. Gingrich just took a stand, and nobody was afraid to take a stand and say, no, we're not going to allow this. We're not going to continue to fund. You're going to have to cut, do some spending cuts. And subsequently, government was at a standstill for almost a week. And you know why it's different now? And no, it's don't. funny. Yeah, I'm going to tell you why. Because the moment, you know, back in, in uh, let's say back in, I don't know, in the 90s, okay, something happened. And, you know, the news, the media may or may not pick it up. Now, you don't need the media to pick it up. You need someone to just go on social media and start a stir. Right. You know, look at what happened with that, that what, what happened in, um, oh, man, what is it, in China, in China, okay, where they used Twitter and they had this big thing, and then even here with this Occupy Wall Street, you just have people going and uh, and sending out social media things, getting together and, and creating uh, uh, creating chaos if they want to. Um, All we need now so right is Nancy now, Pelosi to open up her mouth. Yeah, well, that may happen. <laughs> she she didn't wake up yet. I think she's still sleeping. <laughs> yeah. You know, but um, but yeah. So I, I like I think that social media does play a part in this. You know, and ever since Obama did that town hall meeting uh, with Twitter way back when, you know, that showed people that hey, politics. You know, we can do something. The people can have a say in in what happens. So now you have politicians that are being very careful what they say. Look at what happened with uh, uh, in New York with uh, Weiner. All right, so you know Anthony Weiner, he was uh, supposed to be you know the mayor. You know then he sent out a, a picture of himself, and that 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 collapsed his career. Right. Um, I mean it's just a picture. You know I mean well, a lot of pictures, but uh, it's just it just it, but if, if this was. 15 years ago, 10 years ago, you actually, if it was 10 years ago, you wouldn't have saw anything. You would have, you would have never have heard about it. So social That's media true. does play a big part. It does play a right. big part in what's right. happening. And I think that's right. why you're not going to see someone step up and, and really, you know, put everything on the line and say, hey, the, the line is here and stick to it and we're going to resolve this because what you're doing, you're going to, you, you're going to help systematically collapse you know, the economic system of the United States by doing that. Yeah, you know, and, and I think that's what uh, Boehner is is afraid of. I mean, he's afraid yeah. to take a stand and draw a line in that sand uh, yeah. because of um, the repercussions. Yeah, the backlash. You know, and Boehner is not right. one to back down. You know, he's not one to back down. But in, in, this, in this situation, if you go and you say something, you'll have – you know your constituents. Everyone will start saying something, and they'll, you know, there'll be a Twitter war, or a Facebook war, and all this stuff will happen. And and all of a sudden, you know, that is the news, not the issue. That's the news. Right. You know. Right. So um, I, I think that you know there has to be some sort of compromise. Um, but Obama wants President Obama wants this pass, and I think that. You know, when you're thinking about the cliff, we're not even at a cliff. Right now, we're, we're like, floating. <laughs> we're floating. Well, I, I think uh, that, that Cruz and Boehner said something to me that resonated. You know, they said it'd be a lot different story if uh, the Affordable Care Act was a bipartisan proposal that was passed on a bipartisan measure, and he said it wasn't. It was snuck through the, the, the Supreme Court and snuck through Congress without that bipartisan support. So he said, naturally, there's going to be that backlash from the Republicans because he said it wasn't something that we were even able to vote on. Right. And that, you know, that raises red flags all over the place. Why did it have to be snuck in amongst tens of thousands of uh, pieces of paper? Yeah, you know, what, in, what was, in late sessions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and we know what the reason is because if this would have went another route, it would have been adjusted and changed. And, you know, they, could, they probably could have come to a resolution. 
They probably could have come to a resolution. But you know something? You know, when something like that happens, it it, it becomes problematic, and then, you know, it's going to be hard to, to come to terms. Um, I, think, and I, 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 I think that... The Democrats can say all they want about how great it is for, for pre-existing conditions, but the bottom line is that there was there was no bipartisan agreement on this, and, and ultimately the Republican Party feels slighted that that this passed without their votes. And that and you you, you hit the nail on the head because that is the problem. It, you know, no, you know, and I Republican, Democrats, Independent, whatever it is, no one's saying that hey. You know, there shouldn't be some fairness. If you have a pre-existing condition, you should be able to get insured. You should be able to get X, Y, Z. No one's saying that. What's happening here is that they try to slip this under the door when nobody was watching. Right. And that is the issue at hand. So, right. you know, I, uh, no, I, I, I think, think that's that, the heart of the bad yeah. blood. Yeah. And I think that's what it is. And it, and it, it shouldn't have been that way. You know, if this was so good... Why couldn't both parties sit at the table and figure it out? Tweak this, change this, make this happen. Do this, do that, and you come you come to a resolution. It may not be this golden deal that they have, but it could have been something decent, and it would have been done already, and it wouldn't be impacting corporate America. You have major corporations that are actually changing their policies. They're, they're shifting their health care um, to to and they're shifting it to up the companies to deal with, and they're laying off people because of this. Yeah, they said we're going to be a part time society. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, with even being part time, I mean, what does that mean? Uh, if you're if you have a part time worker, does that I mean, what does it take for that part time worker if they're an employee? They still will have uh, access to having that health care. So, what does that mean? That but you're means they're paying for it versus contractors, and that's going to be it. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and I think true. that also there has to be some fairness uh, with regards to when you say it, you can, if you want to keep your existing policy, you can keep your existing policy. If you want to keep your existing doctors, you can keep your existing doctors. But he said that knowing full well that that was not going to be the case. Nope. That deception of the American pu- people is just something that cannot continue. No, it can't. It can't. There has to be transparency. There has to be, you know, uh, clarity with this because the reality is if, if this should pass, I, I don't think that people really understand the impact because this is not only going to, yeah, you get, you'll get your insurance. Great for you. Okay, what's going to happen in six months when when uh, when when you have ten you know small businesses that go out of business? We have another twenty businesses that lay off half their workers because they can't afford it. All right, then you have other businesses and big companies that move away from here and they move overseas right. because they don't have to deal with it over there. Right. What does that do for this country? And again. Right. You know, we, 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 where's your unemployment rate? Poof, that's going to go through the roof. Right. Okay. Where's, where's GDP what, what, growth? Yeah, the GDP growth's not going to be there. You're going to have welfare recipients, you know, they'll be lining up at the door, okay, because they have no choice. And, and that's problematic, too. I mean, they were even speaking about, you know, putting together the, the uh, that, that uh, employment act for welfare recipients that you're forced to go to work. Okay, you have to learn a skill, which you know I agree. You need to, you should do something to, to not be on public assistance. But what's going to happen when that that rate doubles, triples, quadruples? Okay, you're giving, you, you, they have to go to work where? There's nowhere to work. Right. Well, right now, they're, aren't they obligated to pay back that um, assistance? That I don't know about. I, I know that they have that. Uh, years ago, but then they they kind of wiped that out, and I know there were talks of them doing that again. You know, if they do do that, it's going to be interesting because if you are getting public assistance, they, they're if they're forcing you to go uh, find a uh, skill, go to school, do something, 
and then you have to pay back what you were given, all right, then I mean that's not so I mean that's more of a loan. <laughs> right, right. And and that's kind of like what happened during the Bush administration when we got those refund checks. It it was nothing more than a loan against your future tax bills. Yep. Um, you wind up I mean, paying one way or the other. <laughs> right. And I don't, I don't think that, uh, um, you know, that the the ease of which they said now over um, 50 million Americans are on uh, food stamps, and and there's all of this um, uh, going to strip bars, buying uh, cigarettes and booze with your bridge cards, uh, you know. Uh, so much of that is is so wrong, and mm-hmm. and then you get uh, guys on uh, Bill O'Reilly's show as a surfer who who uh, uh, literally is ecstatic over the fact that he doesn't have to go to work and that he's collecting this food stamps and all he has to do is surf all day long and is proud of it. Um, sends a wrong message. It definitely sends a wrong message, you know. And, and look, granted, there are a lot of people that abuse the system, you know. And those people, they hurt people that actually need the help. And I've said this all along. Anytime we 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 brought up the topic, there are people that that really need it. You have good people that really need it, and they they're struggling, but they're not lazy. But meanwhile, you have people that are lazy that don't want to go to work and they just want to live off the system, and that that becomes problematic. Because then that becomes an epidemic, and if that's the way this country is going, oh my God, we're in we're in for some hell of a ride. Right, right. It's it's going to be some challenging times, and I think you're right, though, Lou. I think as of next year, when uh, when all those higher costs come into play, uh, I think then that's when the American public is going to really see what happened. And I don't think they're going to be happy. Yeah, they're not going to be happy. Look, and I'll even touch on this topic, too. You know, let's talk about tech, all right? You know, the world of tech has been booming around the world, all right? And you know what the sad part about it is that here in the United States, you don't have enough qualified engineers and programmers that can actually fill the positions that are needed. You know, and that's because, you know, the the kids are – it's funny, I don't know for how many years, it must have been for me, for me for a long time. I go to college, become a doctor, become a lawyer. Okay, and now it's like the engineers, we're the engineers. And then basically the engineers are overseas. That's that's where they train. And, you, you, I mean, you don't have a lot of, you don't have a lot of them over here. Um, and what's happening is that immigration, you know, is, is playing a part in and the issue as, as far as uh, talent. So, again, it's going to stifle growth here in the States because, you know, you're not giving people with skills. You know, if you, again, just going on, on the, uh, the public assistance, you have people that are on this, you know what? You, you put them in a field that they can actually prosper. Teach them how to work with computers. Teach them engineering. Teach them something like that so they can get a skill where they can actually work for uh, an industry that is actually craving these talented individuals. See, there are options, but uh, it's, it's just interesting to me that uh, those options are never tapped into uh, for whatever reason. Right. And by the way, in technology, uh, the, the the trend that I see developing is big data. These these data centers are yep. uh, are going to be coming more and more into focus, uh, even yeah, as well, some you of these servers. Cloud. Yes. Right, cloud computing. You have the big servers. You, you know, you have, you know, everything is big data, because that big data, right now they don't know what to do with it, but the reality is that big data is going to be utilized. People need to understand this in, the, in tech. That's going to be utilized for everything, to, to 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 show what you like, what you don't like, what what you can eat, how you're going to walk today, and how, you know, maybe how you're going to feel today. They have technology that that actually can do this stuff. And it's going to start developing. You see the stuff that uh, in, 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 sci- in sci-fi movies. That stuff's going to be real. 
Um, they just haven't figured out how to utilize that yet. But that big data, that cloud, uh, is getting is getting is, is going to be the next big thing. Right. Right. And and, and I think that uh, that more and, and more of these the yeah, these data centers are going to be uh, uh, more in demand as as that uh, trend continues. Yeah, yeah, and and again, it, it comes down to what what kind of jobs are out there. You know, you're not a doctor, you're not a lawyer, you're not an accountant, you're not, you know, you, 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 there, there, is, there are opportunities out there. There are opportunities out there. But again, you know, even if if these tech companies, big data companies, social media companies, things like that, even if they have the talent, you know, I think, again, even with those companies, you know, they, they're going to get hit to uh, should this Obamacare go through, this affordable health care. Uh, act, you know, even though like a company like Google, they go and they treat their employees like gold. But once you start, you know, implementing this, basically now a responsibility falls on these companies. Even though they treat their employees, they give them the best insurance and everything in the world. The it, it still falls on their shoulders. Well, and and they said though that that those entitlement programs, for example, like pension funds, they said that throughout the United States, that if you took a, a conglomeration of all these pension funds, they're underfunded by $90 trillion, and they said there's not enough money on the entire globe to make up for that deficit. So they're wow. very concerned about the um, entitlement programs, specifically um, these pensions, and they said, Chicago is next. Their pensions are so underfunded um, and that after Detroit, it's going to be Chicago. And after Chicago, it's going to be New York. And they found out just recently in Detroit that instead of reinvesting those, uh, those dollars in, back into the pension fund, that the Kwame Kilpatrick administration paid out over $900 million in distributions during his term. Wow. So, so the 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 Detroit bankruptcy scandal continues to unfold. Well, yeah, and that that was uh, an abuse of power in Detroit because you know I mean you still see the pictures of of Detroit and what they've done. You know, beautiful homes abandoned. Right. Uh, you have, you know, government, no, well, not government workers, but private businesses just, hey, you know what, we're done. Okay, and just get up there, getting up and leaving. And it's and it's a sad state of affairs. And the thing is, too, you know, you would think, I remember that uh, they used to run a, an ad for Detroit trying to get tech businesses, tech companies to go there and do business. It was so great to do business over there. So great. You know, and they, you know, you can't even trust the government to go and, no. and do the right thing for the community, for 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 the people. And, 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 that, and they that's, said it's been that's, it's been a problem that's been it started with Coleman Young back in 1974. Yeah, and, and look at it, look at look at what happened now. You know, but you don't you don't you just hear a blurb here and there, but you don't see it. Uh, you don't see it anymore. You hear you hear the the the, the uh, rumblings, but you know uh, Obama doesn't want to pay attention to that because it's not good for business. It's and not and, good and for you business. know, there's this uh, this um, uh, fallacy in, to to the American public that the economy is growing, uh, the deficits are shrinking at a rapid pace. He said more rapidly during my term than ever before. Really? Where? Is, is that like when when Mayor Giuliani was in New York, and then all of a sudden all the homeless people disappeared? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they they, they came back. <laughs> yeah. Where where'd they go? They I think they shipped them to Detroit. Yeah, yeah. yeah they did what uh, Fidel Castro did during the uh, the the Cuban. Uh, uh, crisis, uh, put them all yeah, on a boat and sent them to Miami. 
Yeah, he says, yeah, we're going to send you people. We'll send you all the prisoners and the criminals and, and, all, and all the derelicts and everything, all that other stuff. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get, get rid of all the jailbirds. Yeah, they say, go, 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 go to America. And, that's, I mean, that's what really happened. That's what really happened. And now, you know, again, we're, we're, we're in a state um, of, um, of confusion. And I think that if, if they don't sit down, and, and this is what kind of bugs me about the Affordable uh, Health Care Act, is that Obama doesn't want to bend on anything. Now, how could you not want to bend? You, you have to come to some sort of resolution. We live in a de- democracy, right? This is, we're not communist. This is not a socialist, uh, you know, uh, nation, not yet. You know, there has to be some sort of compromise. We have, we have parties right. for that reason. And I hate to say this, but it's almost as if, and other senators have pointed this out, it's almost as if his mission is to make the Republican Party look bad at any cost and that he doesn't have to have any bipartisan uh, uh, negotiations. It's either my way or the highway. Uh, see that, that, you know, it, and I, it's sad. Because, look, he got reelected for the second term. This is his legacy. Whatever he does now, that's going to go down in the history books. All right? And it would be really, it would be really horrible if, he, if, if everything started to collapse, as it has been. It has been for, for a little while. Well, um, but even further, it, at, at because of his decision to yeah, uh, his and, forcing it, and he was voted in by a majority of younger people in this uh, economy, and yet why is it then he's spending $50 billion or more to go ahead and have these young people enlist in uh, this Obamacare with uh, football stars and, and other stars and celebrities uh, and, and these younger people who supported him um, are not interested because they know they can stay on their parents' policy until they're 26. Why would they go out and enlist and pay for Obamacare then? There's no need for it, you know. And then, and then let's even go a little further than that. You you have all these these young people that are you know they're they're going to college, they're coming out to no jobs, right? Okay, I mean that, that I mean if that's not a red flag, I don't know what is, right? If you've got no you, money you, after you college, how are they, yeah, yeah. they going to pay for Obamacare? Yeah. You can't you have no money to pay your college your, your college bill, and then this is happening. You have no job when you come out, but then you have the debt over your head, so you can't even go get a home. You can't even be a first-time uh, homeowner for some time because you have this debt lingering over you, so what are you supposed to do? And, and it, becomes, it becomes a, a circle that, no one. It seems that no one's paying attention to. It's like it's like things are happening in slow motion. Like you see someone jumping out a window, slow motion. They're coming out a little slow. You can save them, and you're just watching. And you, I, yeah, no I think one's doing though anything that to stop it. I think that's why these approval ratings are falling, because mm-hmm. the young people see what's going on, and and is and is is, is the evidence of the cost of this health care program come into play, and they said the operational costs alone are 80 to $90 billion. Mm-hmm. It's going to be stifling. When and, you know, man, you know, on top of that, John, that, you know, and I uh, touched on that Occupy Wall Street, you know, all these kids were protesting. They, I mean, I don't think they know what they're protesting about. They're protesting <laughs> against Wall Street companies and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, they're drinking their Starbucks latte, which is five bucks, and doing all this stuff. And meanwhile, they're 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 saying, "Hey, give me a job." Oh, we'd love to give you a job, but guess what? We have this Affordable Health Care Act. It's, it's going to prevent us from giving you that job. So now, guess what? Now you have to go. You probably have to go to California to get that ten dollar minimum wage. And, and yet, in Seattle, they wanted fifteen dollars an hour. And of course, yeah. it's not it's not going to affect the the cost of services and cost of products and goods, and and it's not going to have any effect on inflation, Lou. No, no, of course not. You'll you'll be you'll be paying 
15 bucks for a Starbucks latte, you know, <laughs> if, if all that stuff happened. And, and on top of that, you know, you, you also have the, the situation where people aren't, they, they, they don't have their eye on the ball. They're, they're pointing at the wrong problem. They're focused on a problem as opposed to, as opposed to finding the solution. And they, 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 the problem they're focusing on is the wrong problem. But, Lou, I can't survive on $7 an hour. I've got to have $15 an hour. How am I supposed to make a living and, and cover all my expenses on $7 an hour? Yeah, well, what about those people that were, uh, were, were protesting with fast food, and I think they wanted like 18 20 bucks an hour. Okay, you're going to flip burgers and do dishes, you're going to get that? Yeah, you know what? I think you'll have a lot of people willing to do that. Well, the whole you know, purpose I mean, for getting an engineering degree is so that while you're in college earning 7 bucks an hour at McDonald's, you're not supposed to stay at McDonald's your entire life. Right, and that is supposed to be a launching pad for you. It's only for you to put money in your pocket for you to go, you know, to greater things. It's sad because some people get stuck there because, yeah, you right. may have people that are on public assistance that maybe that's the only job they can get. I get it. But guess what? Those jobs were not created for a future. Right. That's the problem. You know, right. It's like you're, you're delivering papers. Yeah, guess what? You kind of hit your ceiling. You're not going any further than that. Right, you know, and, so. and it, it wasn't meant, meant to be a career uh, where you're working at a fast food chain and complaining that you're not getting fifteen dollars an hour. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's not it's not a uh, they're not looking at things the the right way. They're not looking at things the right way, but I guess we'll see what's going to happen as we move forward. You know, a lot of things have to change, and uh, and John, you know, we have about. Uh, about two and a half minutes minutes left in the show, so uh, why don't you you know give some some details on what you're doing, and I'll let you uh, give your last words uh, on the show because again, you know you 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 have your fingers on the pulse of the private equity market, and as you said, that's what's going to drive any growth, okay, or are these companies even surviving after what's going to happen, you know, come come the new year. Right, and we're we're looking at trends, Lou, of uh, non-correlated assets uh, uh, such as uh, entertainment. Uh, we're looking at uh, real estate, both commercial and residential. We're looking at energy, uh, diversified portfolio of mixture, oil, gas, equipment, uh, and and uh, clean tech. Um, we're we're looking at uh, at also. Um, real estate in, in the hospitality and, and senior assisted living. So we're, we're seeing, and, and the things that we try to look for is those niche uh, trends that, uh, that are developing so that our clients can capitalize on those, uh, like you said, those next big trends. And that's, right. that's the whole thing. And if they look at my blog, they'll see more of this at www at reo capital llc dot com, and um, you know we try to put up um, articles about the economy, blogs about the economy, and about funding, uh, what's uh, doing well, growth equity versus venture capital, uh, who's winning, who's not. So there's a, there's a lot of information there. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I urge our listeners to go to reo capital llc dot com. Find out what John is talking about, and you know you're gonna get a lot of insight every week uh, from him because he has his, pulse, his fingers on the pulse of private equity. And now it's not just about you know uh, getting funding for private equity; it's also looking at opportunities for private equity. So companies that are looking, you know, for an exit strategy, you may want to get in touch with them, and he can uh, guide you along the way. Uh, but John, you know, again, as always, great to have you on. You know, hopefully. We'll have you on next week because I think we're going to have a lot of stuff to talk about with the Chrysler filing for their IPO and everything else that's going on on Capitol Hill. So hopefully you'll you'll be with us next week. Sounds good, Lou. All right, John. Thank you so much. And again, uh, our listeners, go to REO Capital LLC, and we'll be back with you next Monday, uh, seven o'clock. Uh, you don't want to miss it. And until then, have a great trading week. You're listening to UCW Radio. 
in your face. What we got here is a failure to communicate. Oh, have I got your attention now? Please relax with that word. It's good. You know what I mean? Money to be made in a place like this. Money never sleeps, pal. You're crazy. Don't run when you lose. Don't whine that hurt. You know what it takes to sell real estate? It takes brass, brass.